All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome again. Uh, my name is Jordan Treacle, uh, and uh, thank you so much for being here today for this virtual session titled The Neolini Global Process, Working Together on People's Solution for the for Food Sovereignty. Uh, again, my name is Jordan Treacle. I work for the National Family Farm Coalition, which is a founding member of La Via Campesina uh, in the United States. And I'm going to play the role of moderator for this session today. But let's start off with just a few logistical details. Uh, we have interpretation in English and Spanish. Many thanks to our interpreters. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Uh, you can find the interpretation button on your screen. And just remember to, a reminder to our speakers as well as attendees that when we work with interpretation, we need to moderate how fast we speak. Uh, we need to silence any sounds or notifications on our computers and limit background noise. In terms of our program today, this is going to be a one hour session panel. And then we'll have an additional 30 minutes of question and answer afterward. For the question and answer period, we're going to have to change virtual rooms through the link provided in the chat at the end of the session. Uh, we encourage everyone to join the Q&A. Uh, you all are welcome to send questions to the panelists in the chat during the panel session or hold them until the end of the presentation. But either way, we won't be addressing the questions until the end uh, during the Q&A period. Finally, we're going to face hard stops in terms of our time together at the end of the panel presentation and the question and answer session. The topic we're covering today is deeply important and complex, touching on a range of systemic issues in our food system. Uh, I'm getting a chat because maybe I'm sharing my screen. No, I am not. Maybe I should be, but I'll keep going. Um, we're going to be touching on a range of systemic issues in our food system, which is all to say there's a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Uh, so we're asking both our speakers and our attendees to please, please be concise with your interventions so that everyone who wants to can be involved in the conversation. And while it really pains me to cut anyone short, that's what I've been asked to do today to keep us on time, but I would rather not. So let's collectively be conscious of our time. And also, I think it goes without saying, we expect kindness and respect shown to all the speakers and participants. So with that, I'd just like to kick us off by welcoming everyone again to this session. In the midst of multiple interrelated crises, including climate change, systemic racism, war, gender violence, and staggering inequality, to name just a few, the global movement for food sovereignty has, for the better part of three de decades, been organizing a strong community-centered uh, and bottom-up counter-response to these challenges. Over the course of 25 years, since the concept of food sovereignty was formed, this movement has fostered an intersectional convergence of thousands of communities, organizations, and institutions to construct a long-term advocacy and organizing agenda that spans local to global governance levels. This movement has also had to, had to adapt to new challenges and opportunities over these years, while remaining true to its founding principles and accountable to its base. The peasants, indigenous peoples, and food providers across our territories who feed our communities. So today to talk about some of this history, where the movement stands today, and what is on the horizon, we have a really inspiring group of speakers who have been leaders in the food sovereignty movement in their communities and at the global level for many years and represent three different regions of the world. Unfortunately, we had one uh, additional speaker who is dealing with a family medical emergency, so we're having to adapt a bit our program on the fly. Uh, but uh, the three speakers we have today are, are really uh, inspiring, and I'm sure you all enjoy. So I'm going to let them uh, in introduce themselves in a short round of introductions, 
And then we'll transition to the core part of the panel focused on the annealing process itself. So with that, I'd like to call on Saul to introduce, introduce himself first in two minutes. Go ahead, Saul. Good morning, good evening. First of all, I want to I wanted to greet you in my um, language Zapoteca. Uh, that comes from the um, Oaxaca state in Mexico. I wanted to um, say thanks to all those who invited us to this important event where we can share the work we are performing what we call the Global Nealini Forum on Food Sovereignty. Sovereignty. As I said, I'm from Zapoteca, Mexican. I'm a member of the um, Secretary um, of La Unidad de la Fuerza Indígena y Campesina, a national organization. I'm also producer, part of a cooperative called Konderavi, Konderayu in our own language. It's the concept of food sovereignty. And we are also working on the conservation of a tree variety the mosquito tree, it has many properties and we can preserve, so we can preserve our traditional plants. So again, thanks for the invitation. I also wanted to dedicate my words uh, to one of our young members who just died some days ago in a very tragical accident. He was part of the of our coordination team of the sovereignty program of the Consejo de Tratados Indios. Our thoughts are with you. We are still very sad. This fight is also part of his fight. Thank you. I also wanted to give you a bit of historical context. Sorry, Saul. Un momento. Sorry. I will come back to you, Saul. Many thanks for the introduction and, and our condolences to your community for your loss. Um, I'm going to allow uh, Chuki and, and Paola to also introduce themselves, and then I come back to you, Saul, in one minute. So, Chuki, please. Take the floor and introduce yourself in two minutes. Thank you. Many thanks, Chuki, for being here. Uh, and Paola, please take the floor and introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, also, thanks from my side to the organizers uh, for, you know, for organizing again the Oxford Rio Farming Conference online version. Um, I'm Paula Joy. I'm originally from Brazil, um, but have been living in Germany for about 20 years now. Um, and it is in Germany where, you know, I did the step from the urban areas to the countryside uh, and uh, got to be a small scale food producer. Um, I live in a farm community uh, in the east side uh, from Berlin. 
And uh, here I, I mean, we have a very di diversified farm and myself, I'm a beekeeper here. Um, I'm responsible also for uh, the forest work and uh, doing conservation of the vegetables that we produce and, and, and many other activities as well. And um, a member, or we as farm, we are par a member of uh, the ABL, which is the German member organization of La Via Campesina. And um, yeah, and uh, I've been, I I'm, I'm also part of the coordination committee of the European coordination of La Via Campesina. And together with Saul, um, I'm part of the uh, facilitation group of the, um, of the IPC, no, and the IPC, we're going to speak about this uh, here during the session. Uh, it's the International uh, Platform for Food Sover uh, um, International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, and it's the major actor uh, pushing forward or, or building the movement for food sovereignty uh, glo globally. Thank you, Jordan. Many thanks, Paola, Saul and Chuki for joining us today, lending their voices and, and teaching us in this moment. So uh, with this quick introduction, uh, I will come back to you, Saul, now. Thank you so much for taking the first uh, panel uh, presentation here to tell us a bit about the history of the Neolini process uh, and how uh, this movement has turned the concept of food sovereignty uh, into action over the past years. Go ahead, Saul. Thank you, dear Jordan. And thank you to everybody. To me, it's an honor to be able to share these um, social movement, um, social movements who fight for food sovereignty that have been doing that for 25, more than 25 years. And we think that now it's the time to, to really push to really create a, a new space, this initiative has been uh, created um, mainly by the APC. This is a global platform um, formed by different um, social movements. Um, it was born in the year 1996. And our platform of food sovereignty presents more than 6,000 organizations and it also includes uh, 300, more than 300 um, millions of producers throughout the world. And this platform includes peasants, um, small scale fishers, um, farmers, in um, indigenous communities, rural communities, youth, women, it's a very inclusive platform. In this movement, the IPC has been a dynamic part as a global platform of articulation of different social movements and indigenous uh, peoples. Um, we fought for the rights of food sovereignty um, against land grabbing. We have tried to give them voice uh, to um, aiming to a radical transformation. The first time we did something like this was the Global Forum for, uh, for Food Sovereignty in Mali in 2007. 
this international forum for food sovereignty. Um, it was like the beginning of a long way aiming to um, food for uh, sovereignty. In this case, the concept of food sovereignty was discussed for the first time in the second international um, conference of La Via Campesina that uh, took place in La Scala in Mexico in 1996, one year after the creation of the um, World Trade Organization. That time there were issues were about intellectual property. And that's why mm, social movements syndicates um, we thought that um, food security and development for us were um, just um, smoke. Um, smoke. Uh, screens to really cover what was going on. We were fighting for food sovereignty as a way of rejecting dominance by corporations of the market. We didn't want big companies to dominate agriculture. So we were fighting, this was a battle where we wanted people to have autonomy, to have their own economy. We wanted income based on human rights, based on justice and the respect for our motherland. Nieleni refers to this woman in Africa who defied the rules of discrimination. So this first Nieleni Forum brought together more than 500 representatives of over 80 countries, brought together many stakeholders to talk about our knowledge, to debate all of these different dimensions of food sovereignty about land, seeds, water, about animals, labor and we recognize the very important role of women women in indigenous populations are sometimes the the ones who transfer knowledge you will be able to find information on this nieleni forum so in this first forum in 2007, we concluded a very long process of thought, of reflection, and we managed a transformation or to start a transformation based on rights. Food sovereignty is a right of people. We need crops that are accessible, sustainable, ecological, and people must have the right to decide on their own food system. This meant putting small scale producers first. They would have to be able to create their own distribution system, their own products. And this pro these products have to be at the heart of their system. They have to be more important than markets or than industry and companies. We had carried out previously consultation and we concluded that food sovereignty is a precondition to food to safety. So the presence of indigenous populations was vital during this process. We felt that there was a need to speak with the African 
Council as well, to advocate for indigenous peoples. This position of ours was widespread. It The African Council eventually withdrew its position and then the General Assembly managed to approve the rights of indigenous populations. So this was a very important moment for us, and it was thanks to an organized articulation of all of our groups. We also helped small scale agricultural associations. We helped develop proposals that made our movement both a space for social vindication, but also a space to solve the food problems around the world. In February 2015, I think, the social movements of small scale producers, uh, workers, women, indigenous peoples, environmentalists, and human rights advocates got together in Nieleni to agree on a multi sectoral vision of what agroecology is. And we created strategies to defend agroecology and to obtain food sovereignty. On this occasion, we agreed that agroecology is a way of life. It's a science. It's a movement that transforms food systems, that accomplishes food safety. Agroecology is based on different principles, but that can be applied in many diverse territories. Ultimately, there are peoples who share values, who respect the motherland. So this is the basis of our vision. Agroecology is based on ancestral knowledge that comes from from decades, from centuries ago. And we want to continue these traditions and pass them on to future generations. We want to foster this relationship with our motherland and with all the beings in the country. The movement for food sovereignty accomplished very important results among consumers, among indigenous populations, and citizens in general. We try to guarantee the rights of producers, especially the most marginalized peoples. I want to give a few examples. We managed to include the rights of, of farmers in phytogenetic resources. We ensured sustainable fishing at the small scale. We managed to um, have an impact on the guidelines on small scale fishing. And with the movements of IPC, we presented the challenges related to the exploitation of our lands. We managed a transformation within the committee of food security. And we opened the way or we paved the way for participation from civil society. We created a mechanism of civil society. That's what it's called. And this is within the Committee of Food Security. We have constant communication with FAO. And we have a space where we managed to get different movements to participate in this space so that they can have a conversation with small scale producers. We integrated agroecology in different FAO processes. 
and they've now published a document on the principles of agroecology. So this work is what drives the battle of our, of our colleagues. In 2018, La Via Campesina managed to influence the rights of peasants within the United Nations. So this contribution has been significant, I think. However, today we have many crises attacking us. These are very deep rooted crises, social crises, environmental crises, health crises, racism, etc. We have a civilization crisis, I would say. And this is part of the history of oppression that our peoples have gone through. So for us, it is very important, or we are very aware that we cannot find solutions within the structures that already exist. We actually need a transformation of the system. We need a world forum, another Nieleni forum. We need to come together, bring together all these different movements and give our own point of view. We need a systemic change in food sovereignty. And we need support from different groups, different associations, and this will allow us to move forward, to go beyond our own lands and our own territories. I will finish by saying that I want to build this process. I will let my colleague Paula go further in depth, but this context is what I wanted to talk about. Thank you again for this opportunity. And I will be eager to respond to your questions. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Many thanks, Saul, for this important overview and background on the Neolinian and food sovereignty movements. Um, and there's, a, there's a rich history here, and I'm sure there'll be more to go into in the Q&A. Thank you for giving this overview. Um, Let's transition now to our uh, second speaker, uh, Chuki, if you'd like to take the floor and perhaps give us a bit of perspective on how this food sovereignty movement uh, has, has been leading struggles at the national and local levels in your part of the world. Thank you, Chuki. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you, uh, Oxford, uh, for organizing uh, a very important interaction on uh, uh, the food sovereignty movement. Uh, well, to talk about uh, uh, how the food sovereignty movement is, uh, uh, is a reality at our local struggles and our, uh, at our national struggles, uh, I can uh, start with a reference uh, which is quite recent. Uh, and uh, I hope, uh, most of you who have been part of this movement are, uh, uh, you know, are, are familiar or are, are aware of uh, what happened, uh, the historical struggle which uh, the farmers uh, uh, fought in India uh, last year. So uh, farmers uh, in India have been uh, facing an existential crisis uh, since the neoliberal model was pushed uh, into the agricultural sector since 1990s. And uh, this is the only sector where we have been seeing, uh, you know, farmers committing suicides because of uh, uh, non uh, viable, unviable uh, economic model and uh, unviable ecological model and how uh, farmers basically uh, became uh, indebted uh, to the banks because of uh, 
uh, not having the capacity of uh, repaying the loans that they take. And, uh, you know, basically they end up uh, uh, killing themselves. And in the, in the last uh, few years, let's say in the last uh, 20 years, we have seen uh, more than 700,000 farmers committing suicide. And this is uh, a statistics given by the government of India and in which um, mm, women farmers are not considered as farmers, tenant farmers are not considered as farmers. Uh, those who have uh, land titles in their hand are the only one uh, who are part of the statistics. So we can imagine uh, that if even if the number uh, gets double, there is no surprise to it. So having said this, uh, farmers in India have been fighting uh, against the uh, mark in opening of the market for agricultural commodities, uh, fighting against uh, the all the you know mm, the negotiations of WTO and recent uh, uh, free trade agreements uh, in uh, between between two countries, between um, uh, European Union, between Australia and uh, uh, you know, other countries. And uh, one of the major fights uh, farmers have been fighting is uh, the GMOs. So, you know, farmers have been continuously struggling uh, against uh, the onslaught of a neoliberal model since more than 25 years now. Uh, but recently what happened uh, during uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, government of India altogether, you know, uh, came up with, a, uh, with three laws in the name of farmers uh, and presented it in the parliament and passed it through an ordinance without even discussing it. So it was pandemic, the whole country was shut down. Farmers were facing uh, their own issues regarding market accessibilities and producing uh, uh, what to produce, what not to produce and how long the lockdown is going to go on and things like that. And there were deaths and uh, there were lack of hospitals everywhere. But the government uh, of India, instead of looking at uh, the emergency, it passed three uh, major uh, laws uh, concerning agriculture. So the three major laws were all uh, passed in the name of uh, upliftment of the farmers, in the name of uh, uh, supporting the small farmers, etc. So uh, one of the law uh, uh, which said uh, the farmer produce uh, trade and commerce bill, you know. Uh, basically, uh, it was about uh, opening uh, corporate sector to enter agriculture produce marketing, uh, you know, uh, committees and set up their own uh, markets and uh, to to uh, to start purchasing from the farmers uh, at their own terms and conditions. And the second law, which said, uh, which was called as the Farmer Agreement of Price Assurance and Farm Services Bill, it was nothing but contract farming. It was nothing but uh, how uh, you know corporate companies can just very easily get into a contract farming, where farmers themselves will work as laborers in their own farm. The third law was Essential Commodities Amendment Act, where uh, you know, the corporate uh, companies were allowed basically to hold uh, and stock uh, the food commodities, food products, and uh, play around it and create uh, an artificial shortage and, uh, you know, leading to food crisis. So uh, basically farmers in India have been asking for a uh, minimum support price for all those products that we have been producing, uh, including uh, milk, 
and uh, you know we have a law uh, you know we have a well we don't have a law but we have a uh, a mechanism to calculate a minimum uh, price for every food product based on the uh, cost of cultivation so uh, when the farmers were actually asking for uh, you know the 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 methodology of uh, calculating the minimum support price has to be changed and it's not scientific and it has to get more uh, scientific uh, scientific because it is not even uh, remunerating uh, the cost of production uh, you know and we wanted a, a legal structure for minimum support price mechanism uh, the government went ahead and uh, started talking about uh, you know mm, corporatization of markets and uh, agriculture so uh, farmers uh, especially in the north of india uh, where uh, most of them are grain farmers who grow wheat and rice and who are depending on minimum support price mechanism uh, you know they they took it very seriously and in the, in the middle of the pandemic they occupied the streets of delhi and all the you know five major uh, borders of delhi were occupied for 13 months uh, and uh, hundreds and thousands of farmers occupied these uh, borders and they sat there till the government withdrew the law so the slogan was if the government doesn't withdraw the law we will not go back home so the government tried to suppress the movement uh, in all possible ways. Uh, the government even uh, uh, did not even accept uh, us as farmers. They first said that we were not farmers, we were terrorists. We were uh, separatists. Uh, we've become from a Khalistani separatist movement and, and things like that. Uh, you know, it tried uh, all its ways and uh, to basically uh ignore the struggle of the farmers but finally after 13 months uh the prime minister of india mr narendra modi had to go on the television screen and announce that we are withdrawing these laws because some farmers were not happy about it this struggle you know uh which the farmers of india led was not just against uh, the three uh, laws which government of India had uh, pushed over agriculture sector. This was a struggle to defend our identity. This was a struggle to defend our uh, our uh, you know livelihoods. This was a struggle to defend our uh, you know lifestyle, which is built around agriculture, around farming systems, and this was a struggle to uh defend food sovereignty so uh yeah uh you know what we what we learned from this struggle is that uh if uh people from all sections of the society come together on a common agenda and fight with non-violence it is possible to win the battle and you know, and get the world in the right direction. This is what we have witnessed. This is what we have experienced in the recent struggle in India. And, uh, you know, it's very important to bring together uh, all section of the society on food sovereignty because food sovereignty is not just one concept. It has to become a principle which is integral to all our arguments and all our narratives and all our systems. Because as Saul was saying, the present system has nothing to offer. The climate change is so rampant in you know, all over the world. You know, where I come from, this year we have just seen rain. We have not witnessed neither summer nor winter. So rain has created such a havoc 
uh, in our country that we have seen floods and we have lost all crops. There is going to be, we are going towards another food crisis. We are going towards uh, another food inflation. So if uh, food sovereignty as a principle is not taken seriously, not just by the producers, but also by the consumers and the policymakers, uh, we are definitely going towards uh, an, an existential crisis. And uh, we have a very big responsibility towards the future generation. Let us not forget about it. Let us remind our uh, policymakers that you know, the, the policies on agriculture has to be around food sovereignty and it cannot be a choice between chemical farming or organic farming or natural farming. You know, natural farming or agroecology is not a choice anymore. It is the way and it is for us, at least it is our, we believe that it is our constructive resistance. And we have been building models of agroecology in our communities, in, in, in wherever, we, wherever we are, but it is also important for the policymakers to understand that. And uh, yeah, having said this, uh, I stop here. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity and uh, to share uh, our uh, ground experience. Thank you. Many thank you, many thanks uh, Chuki for this uh, intervention and uh, this background and giving us this perspective from the ground uh, in India. I can just say that from um, our, our farmers, uh, and peasants in the United States, we feel a strong sense of solidarity with your struggle, um, uh, particularly around the uh, the fair price support, uh, making sure that farmers can cover their cost of production here in the United States. So thank you for this perspective. Uh, we'll transition now to our final presentation from Paola. Uh, Paola, I'll give you the floor to, and perhaps you can tell us a bit about the, the multi-layer crises that we're trying to face in today uh, moment and, and where the neo process process uh, goes from here, what is on the horizon to address these, these challenges. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jordan. Uh, thanks also to Saul and uh, Chuki you know, for these previous presentations, which I think, uh, set very well the ground you know, uh, for my part. You no, know, On one hand, bringing us the history back. You know, um, uh, so where are we built on? And on the other hand, also bringing the local experiences, the local struggles, and also the local victories, uh, which is the base for any global struggle. You no, know? Because if we don't have roots, we are only in a bubble. You no. Know? Um, so thanks very much, uh, both of you. And um, yeah, thanks also again to the organizers of the uh, Oxford Real Farming Conference. Um, it is, as I said already before, no, it's the third time that we go online. No, this is maybe a development that we have from the pandemic, no, that brings uh, in, this, uh, exact, uh, in this specific context, uh, maybe a lot of enrichment you no know, for, for for the conference you no know, allows uh, allow us to you know to exchange globally you no know, but at the same time we should not forget that uh, this pandemic you no know, in many other spheres had uh, or has uh, been uh, dis disastrous you no know? um, and uh, yeah the impacts have uh, you know um, uh, yeah uh, created, for example, a new food crisis and so on. You know? But before I come to that, uh, maybe as Saul was uh, saying, um, the IPC, no, I don't need to uh, reintroduce the IPC because Saul already did. Um, the IPC came together uh, in December 2019 you know, to reflect about the context we were in. You know? um, so I think it's important to understand that this reflection, this analysis took place before uh, the global outbreak of COVID. You no, know, COVID or was already there in China, but it was not yet a global pandemic. You no, know? but even there, you no, know, in December 2019, um, we were already facing a multiple crisis. You no, know, globally. You no, know? 
and the IPC members, the IPC organizations, uh, based on our uh, common political analysis, decided to relaunch a global uh, process towards uh, the strengthening you know, uh, of, of food sovereignty, you know, uh, with the idea to strengthen our capacity as food sovereignty movement to confront this multiple crisis we are living, you no know, climate crisis, poverty crisis, um, Later on, the, the health crisis would come, uh, the financial crisis, the social crisis, um, crisis of rights and food crisis. You know? um, what we could not imagine in December 2019 was that the situation would so quickly uh, worsen you know? um, and that, uh, you know, that we would be entering very, very soon the third food crisis in fifth, within 15 years. No, um, and this uh, repetition of food crisis you no know, has been showing the failure you no know, um, of the system to deal with the root causes, uh, yeah, of the crisis. Let's say you no, know? um, but it's also important to uh, to 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 recall that any food crisis that we have been facing is not the result of lack of food. You no, know? we have enough food. Uh, globally, you no, know, to feed the population, the problem relies on the distribution of the food and on the price of food. You no, know? um, so each of these crises has been exposing not only the uh, inability of the agro-industrial food system to respond to this successive crisis, but also how much such a system also contributes to creating new crises. No, I think this is uh, an interesting aspect. So now the pandemic came, no? uh, so early 2020, no? the, the, the peasants in India were already on the streets no? uh, and, and the world started facing this pandemic uh, and uh, this pandemic confronted with us with completely new challenges. And I don't need to name them because each of us no, uh, who were living that time know uh, about this challenge. But um, yeah, while people uh, were struggling on the ground to survive, and uh, we, and and we as social movements, no, we have started to face a period of almost two years of um, honestly uh, of international disarticulation. No, it has been extremely uh, extremely difficult for us work remotely no uh, it doesn't allow us to um, to have enough uh, uh, coordination no um, and at the same time the capital no has been uh, taking advantage of this uh, situation of this disarticulation of the social movements um, and has been um, advancing no in global institutional processes no um, another thing that we saw was the capital advancing um, with digital technology. You no, know? so the digitalization uh, started to be this, the solution for everything. It doesn't matter if it was in uh, education, if it was in health system, or if it was in agriculture. You no, know? digital uh, digital tools are the solution for everything. You no, know? um, so. The social, the political, and the economic impacts of the pandemic, they have been huge. You know? Currently, you know, starting in 2022, um, another layer was added to this, uh, to this context, you know, to this crisis context. Um, the, the, the war you know, taking place in, in Ukraine, you know, the, the, the Russian invasion to Ukraine, you know, uh, started a war between two major agro export countries and uh, yeah as I said brought a new layer to the food crisis and uh, which has been had had been already reinitiated by the COVID pandemic and this war um, is being instrumentalized in in almost all I would say United Nations uh, spaces you no know, uh, for geopolitical purpose while the people on the ground, they are the ones who go hungry. You know? um, and as I said, although more than enough food is produced today to feed everyone in the planet, almost one in 10 people um, go hungry every day. You know? 
So from 2019 to 2022, the number of uh, unnourished uh, people, it grew by as many as, as 150 million. No? And we can say that this food crisis uh, has been uh, main, main, majorly uh, driven by uh, conflict, by climate change, and also by the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, another interesting thing to mention is that probably this is the first time in history you know, that our societies are experiencing, experiencing uh, such an accumulation of serious and deep interconnected crisis in once. You know? But I also don't have good news. You no, know? this multi-layered and this multifaceted crisis continues to worsen dramatically. You no, know? and the numbers of people suffering increases also daily. Um, and at the same time, and this is also not a, a not new, the ones profiting from this context are the private corporations, uh, is the private capital, you no, know? and um, they are the ones who have also within the United Nations system been taking over power, you no, know? taking over power from member states, uh, uh, even, you no, know? um, they have been developing more and more a so-called multi-stakeholder system in which every, everything is voluntary, no one is accountable, and uh, conflict in, of interests are obvious, but at the same time they are ignored. No? And this, trade, uh, this trend leads uh, to uh, increased inequalities and to uh, the fragil fragility of the global food system. Now, this is the context what we can do, no? So it's important to take action. Institutionally, as uh, Saul uh, already mentioned, no, the IPC has been struggling very hard, for example, in the um, Committee on World Food Security, you know, through the civil society and ind indigenous people's mechanism, um, and, uh, and, and has been pushing for urgent institutional actions, no, to respond. To, to this immediate needs. And we strongly believe how important it is to have coherent uh, 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 responses, no? uh, coherent to the long-term transformations that we need. And this response, they must be coordinated. No? And we believe that uh, the space to confront the food crisis is the Committee on World Food Security. No? This is the, the most appropriate space where the ones who are in the center of the food system, they have a place around the table, no? Um, but at the same time, our analysis as IPC is that this institutional struggle is not enough, no? We have to go beyond that. We have to follow, for example, the, the example of our comrades in India, no? To build movement, to strengthen our movement, no? Autonomously, no? Um, and not wait only for the politics to respond, no? Um, so in order to do that, no, um, we, uh, our analysis as IPC is that we have to keep building alliances. We have to keep strengthening our own processes of shaping the chains, no? Uh, and for that, the IPC plays an extremely important role when it comes to, uh, you know, to the, the food system, no? Uh, plays a big role in bringing together the civil society, the indigenous peoples, um, and the movements, you no, know, to create, to develop autonomous response, to build a process of um, which is capable to to create alternatives from the base, from the territories to the global. And a new element is that uh, in our analysis that considering that we are facing this multiple crisis which have different facets, no? it is important to include new actors in that. No? It's important to have an analysis which is intersectorial and which is intersectional. No? So to build new convergences towards the systemic change um, uh, uh, from, from these different perspectives, because that is like this, that we can build a common political agenda to develop strategies that can really transform the system in which we are in. No? So um, as I will mention, we are now, we, we are, uh, the, 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 the vision of uh, food sovereignty is now 25 years old. Um, 
and it's also time to 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 reevaluate you know what needs to be adapt adapted you know um uh, how can we deepen this concept how can we widen it you no know? um and um in in order to to face really this multiple crisis and uh seek for the needed systemic change you no know? um as I already mentioned, this process must have strong local, regional, territorial roots, no? So because it is like this that it's capable to really reach the people, no? This process needs to reach also new actors beyond the ones who have been already involved in the food sovereignty movement so far, no? So we are thinking about, for example, the new uh, uh, climate change, uh, 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 climate justice movement, um, uh, maybe uh, right uh, uh, movements defending workers' rights, uh, youth movements, gender diversity movements, peace, peace builders, and so on. You no, know? um, so this is more or less like our understanding what needs to be done. And currently, we are um, in a moment of uh, you know opening up gradually uh, gradually the process no in a coordinated way no um, we want to dedicate the year of 20 the years of 2023 and 2024 um, as uh, a period for the regional processes the, 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 the national and regional processes no um, so here it's important if you are interested no to, to be part of that to reach out for example uh, to via campesina, uh, IITC uh, organizations, fisher movements in your territories who are part of the IPC, no, um, and 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 each region will have its own regional process. Process. Late 2024, we want to organize a pre-forum in Mexico. So Saul will be hosting us, and uh, the forum itself, which is not to be considered a, a, a like just a, a, a major event, it is actually the space where the process will, this whole process, this regional processes that we are building, will, uh, how to say this, like everything will come together, you no, know, and will uh, flow into this space, which will then take place in March, 2025, hosted uh, by our Indian comrades. Um, so Chuki is one of the leadership there, um, and where we can also learn a lot from 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 the struggle, uh, yeah, carried by, by 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 our Indian peasants, which was so beautifully already dis described by Chuki. So, if you are interested, stay tuned and get in touch with uh, our movements uh, in the territories, so you can be part uh, of shaping the ch this change together with us. Thank you. Many thanks, Paula, for this important uh, perspective and, and looking forward into the, this movement um, in the coming years. Uh, thank you all, um, Chuki, Paula, and Saul for keeping to time. So we have just uh, a couple minutes left to, to, um, uh, to close out this session before going into the Q&A part of this panel. Um, so perhaps you know it's it's quite difficult to summarize too much um, this this broad discussion, but uh, I just want to recall a few points that that really struck me over this past hour together. Um, I think starting with the points that uh, Saul made that food sovereignty is really a precondition for food security, and this being a starting point of the of the discussion uh, within our social movements. Um, and then building from there and to make sh really showing the linkages between the concept of agroecology and food sovereignty and how through a movement process uh, it, through Neolini, this has solidified really into a global movement uh, of which the IPC has been an important facilitating space for this effort. Um, we recognize uh, that and through this process, there's been a need to examine the power hierarchies within the food system at the global level, as well as between governments and policy fora like the United Nations, which are increasingly being manipulated by powerful corporate actors. And we heard about the powerful example of how this work is being fought for uh, in a nonviolent way uh, in the Indian context. 
And all of this uh, together with the emerging crises of war and the ongoing impacts of COVID-19, um, all of this has led to a renewed call uh, for a, a, re, a, a strengthened intersectional and bottom-up movement to support real solutions to the crises that we face in our food systems and communities. And we see that our vision for food sovereignty provides a conceptual framework for this transformative change. Uh, but we need more action and more people to join this movement to fight for this vision in governments, governance spaces um, at the local and global levels. So with that, uh, we've reached the top of the hour. So I'm going to conclude here and invite everyone to, to, the, to please join us and bring your questions to the Q&A section. Uh, the, I believe a Zoom link has been shared to our audience in the, in the Crowdcast space. Um, and so we will see you there in just a few minutes as we transition rooms. So thank you again to our speakers and thank you for joining us.